Morning, everyone. Morning. That's a pretty good welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules at Coverings. We're a little different this year. We're all getting adjusted to the new normal. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Middle of the week, we're sort of hitting the high point and we'll coast down to Friday. If anybody has any questions, please do not hesitate, but I'm not gonna be standing up here. I'm gonna be out with you. So I, I like to work right, right side by side. So if you have a question, please don't hesitate. I may ask you to hold it until we get moved to another part of the presentation. But before I start, how many people here are certified tile installers? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Al's my security guy outside there. I'm gonna have him walk the door. I'm gonna count on you six to make sure we can get the other people that are in the room signed up before we leave. All right, off we go. So we're gonna talk about, uh, first of all, uh, anybody here uh, an interior designer? Okay, then we don't have to worry about IDCEC. But as we look at time management, how many people have a good, a good grasp of what time management is? How well do we function as managing the time we have? If my wife were here, she'd say, you're doing the talk on time management, really? <laughs> oh well. But we have a definition, our objectives. Second thing, what are the skills it takes to make this happen? It just doesn't happen. It's not that natural, innate ability to manage our time, although we think we can. And the other two are develop a plan, and how do we master that nasty thing called the clock? Because if you've taken the test, you realize what that time frame is. Brad, you had the really rough one. You took that one at the show. I tried to dissuade him from taking the test at the show. Tell me one, one sentence. Why is it difficult to take the test at the show? Uh, because there's a lot of people at the show. That know you. That want to talk to you. So, uh, yeah, it's, it, it was difficult. And if you had one thing that you had to maintain at the show, and we have, we've done numbers of tests at the show, What's the most difficult thing for you to maintain well, as you're working with the people asking questions? Well, yeah, I mean, just being, being kind enough to respond to somebody that's trying to talk to you and be able to concentrate on the test. Uh, How about focus? Yeah, focus, yeah. It's tough to focus, and anyone that's taken the test realize, Chris, am I right? <coughs> focus is, is all about what we've got to do. So let's take a look. The process of planning and exercising conscious control over the amount of time spent on a specific activity. That's the... That's the one of them, so let's talk, oh, this, you were right, this is touchy. Second one, we're now going to move to the planning part of it. Planning or forethought is a process of thinking about and organizing the activities required to achieve a desired goal. That's the only thing I'm going to read off of the slide, sorry. I just felt that that was necessary that I get that accurately stated. But let's take a look at, how do we reduce stress? When you're taking the CTI tests, you are probably your own worst enemy as far as inducing stress. Melissa, am I right? You probably had that working in your head that ah, I gotta do this, gotta do that. It's, it's, it's difficult and we know that. All I ask you to do is show up and do, us, do for us what you do every day. Take the test, but just show us what you can do. And the stress is usually internal. So we then say, we've gotta have this. We've got to have a get it done kind of an attitude because when you do that, that's going to develop this one. You'll have more energy to be able to move past that and become much more focused on that work that needs to get done. In that, that has an equal sign between it. Now we've become more productive. And I'm going to talk about productivity. I've shared with this table here earlier on about tests that I just ran <clears throat> about three weeks ago and one particular young man in particular that we'll talk about. But once we get it, we gotta go for it. Just run with it. So, and I'll back, it's applicable to everything we do in life. So time frame, how we manage that clock is really critical. So here's the CTI test. We have the plan on how we will take the test. How many of you that took the test of the six, how many of you had a plan before you showed up? Wow, that's, that's pretty strong. So, you don't have a, a plan, it's, what is the statement? If you fail to plan, no, if, if, if you, how does that go? Should have written it down before I started. How, how is it? So, is that it? 
Okay. <laughs> we'll see. But here's the key point. Many people are so busy with their job on the, in the field right now that they just basically, um, it's, anybody know the term JIT? Just in time? So a lot, of, a lot of manufacturing facilities use JIT. Everything arrives just before it's ready to be put into production. So showing up for the test on a JIT basis is not a good plan because you have to have that background. You've got to have a plan in your head, and we'll talk about that for sure. But you got that in place, and the difficulty is if you try to think your way through that process, you won't make it because there's not enough time to get that accomplished. So when we look at this one, we have that plan. You don't wait, wait until you get there. These are the same ones we had. So you don't want to be like this guy who's there at the, at the place and he's, gee, what do I do now? Wrong time to think about that. That's the plan that we're talking about. So we want to build it in our mind. If I do a project at home, I'm putting some drainage in from one part of the property to the other. I know I have to shoot two grades, high point, low point. I don't start digging at the low point, and, or at the high point rather, and now I'm, my grade is too low, so now I have to backfill. A plan makes that work. So I know what my grade is here, I know what my grade is here. That's how I do things. I build things in my head. I don't really write a lot of things down, but we do have people, we can think about it, but we have people that may need to put it on a piece of paper, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a great way to plan. So in this case, here's a detail for some stair risers. They did the detail, and then that gave them the process of how they're going to put those risers in place for the installation. But they knew what was involved with every piece of that puzzle. What's the succession of those step risers? Now, there's only two in that particular setting there, and that's those middle two that you see. But there's the rest of them when the staircase is much longer. You've got to make sure that that process is done in advance so that we know what's involved. So there's one that's a very uh, eclectic kind of a blend. I think it's really kind of neat. Some people may think that it's what you have left over in the shop and you just did a couple of risers with it. But I think that's a kind of a neat, it fits the style of the house. It's a Spanish influence, so I think it looks pretty neat. How about this one? This was done by our certified tile installer, number one. Anybody know who that is? Dan Welch. Dan Welch. Unless you're talking to John Cox and he thinks he's number one, but he's, number, he's the number one in the state of Texas, so he'll, rem he'll remind you of that. But Dan and his son Tyler did this at a, a casino. That is not Photoshopped. It gives you the optical illusion that it's folding as it goes through. A tremendous amount of planning had to go into that process because you had to know what the task was. That all was hand cut. That's not water jet. That was all hand cut into that floor of 18 inch porcelain tile. We've got all the cuts to make and there's a lot of small ones. Of course, mixing mortar, setting tile, that's the whole process we've got there, but you've got to get there. So think about it, it saves time. You don't go in there and say, well, I think I'm gonna start right here at the point and that'll be my starting point. Well, I hope we end up back there by the hand, hand dryer. So uh, it just works really well to have that plan in place. So when we know that plan, we have to keep it close to you to review it. And some of you here may have done this and we'll look at it. This is my, this is my pr uh, COVID program. We had to put separations between people taking the test and the foam, foam board with the foil on it worked really well to separate people from one side to the other. So in this case, this young man uh, used that to his advantage and put both sides of the instruction sheet right there. So that was his plan. We give you that plan. That's, that's the job scope that we're asking for that to be used. I'll get used to this before the hour's out. This thing is so touchy, you just breathe on it and it takes three, three steps forward. So again, that saves time. So let's look at the clock. We show up at the job site. I call the test the job site. We show up at 6.30 in the morning. Why so early? Well, to get focused, to get your head drilled into what's going to happen. Any, anybody know what this is? What is that time, Brad? Uh, 7.09, right? It's nine minutes after seven. 
I'm going to answer the question before anybody beats me up, right? He's going to. It's nine minutes after seven. Anybody here ever take a Dale Carnegie memorization course? You, you, you and I are the only two? Do you remember anything about that program? What, what, time did, what, time, what time did it start? What time did it start? I was going to move you up to the front row. It, they start at 726. They're usually in the evening after office hours. It starts at 726. Why would you pick 726? Because you'll remember that number. If you say 7, 730, I, was it 7, was it 730? You give a specific number. The other reason is that was the, the address of my old store in central Pennsylvania before I went to CTF, so I just picked that number. That's how I picked it. So it's nine minutes after seven. I get that question almost every test. That's when it starts. That's when it starts. So what's three o'clock? Three o'clock is sort of the drop dead hour, the time where you say you've got an hour left. It's no pressure, hopefully not, but it's just to try to keep you understanding, and I try to have a clock at the site so that people can look up, oh, it's 2.15, okay, I'm good. I think I know where I am, and I'm actually working on one. I'm using these clocks and going to put that out to each new installer taking the test to just give a little bit of a guideline. Where should I be at this point? Where should, well, time-wise, just to try to correlate that together. So, of course, there's the infamous one right there. We've got to be done at four o'clock. That's a hard stop. So if we either run the clock or the clock runs us, so that poor guy's just running in circles, that's what happens. We've got to work that clock to our advantage. So and there's the case, there's the CTI module. Uh, a couple of you have been to my facility in South Carolina. That's all set up, ready to go. We got to get the vapor retarding membrane on. How many people here know what vapor retarding membrane is? It's in the code, and people say, well, we don't do it here. Well, it's not my problem that the code doesn't have an enforcement in your area, but if you're using uh, cementitious backer units or you're using a fiber cement product, they require that that paper is back there to retard the moisture from going through the product into the cavity behind, whether they be wood studs or metal studs. So that's the requirement. People said, well, why is that so important? Well, that's because that's what the code says, and it's also what is in the TCNA handbook and ANSI standard as well. It's, it's a requirement. So then we have the backer board installation, of course, but we have to know what those requirements are. So you see the shims in here? That's how we are evaluating the test now so that we can visually look at those until the manufacturers of horseshoe spacers have changed the color on us. That's just caused some real grief. But anyway, so we look at that. We know what those requirements are. It's a quarter of an inch. We need a quarter of an inch expansion space between any change in plane, floor to wall, inside corner wall, and if we had a ceiling, it would be there as well. So anytime we change planes, that's the requirement. And so how do we do with this one? There we have a quarter of an inch. That's the perimeter movement joint. Is that adequate? Melissa, help me. Thank you. There you go. There you go. So that and black, a black horseshoe spacer is a quarter inch. I'm sorry, I should, have, I should have said that. So how about that one? We've got that one at a quarter at the bottom. So at the bottom, we're good. Around the perimeter, we're good. But then when we get to the top, the red one is an eighth of an inch. We're half of what it should be. We have to give that wall somewhere to go. I'm from central Pennsylvania originally. It's zero and 100% humidity outside. That wall is trying to get smaller. I have a a pony wall or a, a bulkhead wall, it is 70 degrees and 50% relative humidity on both sides. So this one's dynamic, meaning it's moving. This one's static, it's not doing anything. So we're gonna get a transitional change at that inside corner. We've gotta give it somewhere to go, but it gets worse. The one at the bottom is only a 16th. So that wall doesn't have enough ability to properly move. When we talk about layout, this is the two things I find in the test that's difficult is focus, well, there's probably three, focus, layout, and time management. And we're talking about all three. So in this case, how many people here in daily work use a grid pattern? Meaning we're going to draw the plan on the floor. 
We're going to we're going to pop lines and we're going to have a, a, a layout. Brad, I know you do. If you're doing a large mall project, spacers are just not going to cut it because the spacers aren't perfect, the tile isn't perfect, and you can end up doing this halfway down the run, and lots of embers behind you saying, "Whoa, hey, yeah, that's the finger." You have a problem. So. The grid system works really well, and it's a little bit hard to see here, but let me get, there's the outside perimeter of the diagonal section. Then we have the perimeter border, and we're gonna look at this a, a little bit closer because we're going to allow, and this is the block of wood that we use, that's three quarters of an inch thick. And what that three quarter inch block is utilized for is the thickness of a half inch drywall and quarter inch base of some sort, doesn't matter what it is. Could be ceramic, could be uh, a wood base, it doesn't matter. But that's the finished dimension because when you look here, that's what you're going to see. Not to the, the rough stud wall, which is here, but to the baseboard, to the edge of the cut, that's the size of the perimeter that we would be measuring for the test. So we know that the left and right pieces have to be equal size. We also know that the front and back pieces have to be the same size. The, is the issue here is we're going to use that same three quarter inch block this side, here on either side of the doorway, and on this wall as well. But these are all finished walls, so these are going to have tile on them. That's a calculation that has to be made as well, a deduction or some kind of an adjustment to the size of the area that's being covered. So when we look at a particular spot where the diagonal in the center and has four dots that are spaced equally. This is one method to make sure that it's going to go back the same way that you cut it is the fact that we have them numbered. So in this case, the installer has, I would also mark the dot itself because all his threes are gonna to go together in this fashion and that dot in the center is number three. So if you can use dot number one, for space number three, it may not be exactly the same. And most times, not in this particular test, but most times, because that was the same tile that happened to come as a two by two, but if we use a two by two mosaic, a porcelain mosaic, they're thinner and they may not be perfectly square. So if you spin that dot just 90 degrees, now your joints don't line up. So it's wise to make sure that you have everything going back the same way. These are the perimeter cuts. That's not 17, that's 11, there's 12. So this, he started up here and worked his way around for his perimeter cuts to make sure that they fit. So then we move up to the next point of setting the tile, of course, and all of this process saves time because we have a plan. We're not just working our way through and say, well, gee, I think this is what I'll do next. That's that part we can't really take the time to think about it. It should be just a natural flow. So we have the wall section, very similar to the floor. In this case, we have to know the answer requirements there as well because we need to be centered and balanced and we can't have a tile any less than half size. At least that's the way the ANSI standard reads right now. And Brad, we may have some changes taking place there, but we'll, we'll see how that works out. Because tile's getting smaller or larger? larger. It's getting larger. As the larger size, we have less control over what those size of tiles. So if we have a 24 by 48, it may be really difficult to get a perfect balance between this back wall and this front wall. So we've got to make sure that we understand how that works. So we have to draw a plumb and level line. In this case, there are, you've got the arrows. We, we are utilizing a laser uh, here. So he's got his laser sitting here. The only problem with that is it's a little precarious because if you've got that laser sitting on two pieces of wall tile and his elbow comes back and hits it, he's just lost his layout line. Now you've got to take the time to start and reset it. Personally, that laser, if it were mine, would be outside the module rather than inside because this is my dance space. I work within this space. Out there, I'm not really out there working, but that was his choice and it worked fairly well for him. So he's got those lines on there. So in this case, the arrows are pointing that this particular test was three by six subway in a stack. So the left and right cuts have to be equal in size. And by the way, some of the slides you see are not indicative of what should be occurring. 
but it's just a random use of photographs. So don't say that his mortar troweling doesn't look exactly what we would prefer to have happen in an installation. So our top and bottom cuts, you can see the arrows top and bottom. They have to be the same size as well. And then we move, of course, to the uh, cuts being made. And uh, do you see any cuts laying there? You see a little waste there in the bottom corner, but the unfortunate thing is he didn't make his cuts. This young man actually ran to the wet saw to cut three by six subway tile. Don't, don't shake your head, Brad, we're, we're gonna get there. So we have this option. We have some sort of a cutter board, and I, I'm, I'm not politically correct, I just picked two that I had a photo of. But it could be any myriad, because everybody has their favorite. Brad, do you have a favorite? 2A, superior 2A for this. Oh, old school. Yeah. That's what I grew up on, as you have as well. But you have your grandfather to thank for that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Joseph, what's your favorite? Ishii. Ishii, ah. Monolith. Anybody else? Okay, so we're, we're, we're covering the spectrum, so that's okay. But we have a myriad of snap cutters. I just did this test in the same, where the, some of these photos came from, and a young man came to me and said, this test is way too short. There's not enough time. I suggested to him the wet saw dilemma, which we're gonna look at in just a moment. I said, you spent two and a half hours running back and forth the wet saw. You could have made every cut, well, I'm, I'm ahead of the game. I'll hold that statement for a minute, but you can make cuts on a snap cutter. And he said, bullnose? I said, yes, sir. You can cut bullnose on a snap cutter. And he brought this cutter right here, which to, was my benefit. I couldn't have picked a better cutter because the wheel on that cutter is really small and it rolls up over that radius really smoothly. Some of the cutters, like a, a clinker cutter, you've got a one inch wheel. It doesn't score quite as well. He gave me that cutter. I've never touched that cutter before. Took a piece of bullnose. I said, do you want me to cut it from the radius side short or long? He said, I want to see you do both. I said, okay. So I rolled up the radius, went across, poof, there you go. Spun it around, went across the flat, down the radius, bumped it, poof, there you go. That doesn't make me a magician, but it's possible to use it. He just didn't open the scope of his ability to utilizing that tool, which would have been a heck of a lot more useful than running to the wet saw for every cut that had to be made. So here's just two examples, wall tile, floor tile. Help me out. What's happening here? We, I, I understand we're cutting tile, but what's going on? We're talking about time management here. Brad, saving time somehow. Can you help me? Well, I mean, you're able to stay in one space. I mean, for, for one thing, you're not running around. Everybody hear it? You can stay in one space. We're not running to the wet saw. In the case of the one slide that's coming up, the wet saw would be from here to that handrail that's out there to the second level. One, one way. That's where those two and a half hours got burned up from that young man there. So they're making their cuts right there. Do they lose focus? in that travel back and forth? No, they're right there, there's the cut. Ideally, you're gonna make most of your cuts at one point, you're gonna mark them, lay them to the side, cut them, snap, boom, set them aside, stone that edge, set them aside. Here's the, here's the real problem with a wet saw. Anybody know John Roberts? That's John Roberts. That's his saw. John Roberts had to stand in line to use his saw. That's just John Roberts, because John's a really kind guy, and he had to stand in line to use his own equipment. That's crazy. But that's just John. But waiting in line, what, what do you see about these two guys standing here? Well, yes, that's a given. Well, thank you. How many do they have, Brad? One piece of tile. So they made that trip to the saw, waiting in line to cut a piece, and they're both floor tiles, I'm telling you, every piece of floor tile, we're getting to that, can be made on a snap cutter. All about time. This is a huge waste of time. I see Bart's in the room, and Bart did the voiceover for our video series that is excellent to help people understand. 
Bart said, this is a huge time suck. It just t it takes a lot of time out of your day. And here's the one that I was talking about. That's at least the distance to that uh, handrail out here. You had to walk the, the aisle where the, the racks were on either side, out through the door, and down the loading dock to get to the wet sauce. A huge amount of time. So here we have the fact that you can make the snap cutter wet saw decision because you can make every cut on there except for three. There are only three cuts that you have to use uh, and we used to have the use of angle grinders but they have been uh, banned because of the OSHA requirements that came out in late 2017. But we have the two at the doorway that have to be made with a, with a, because they're L cuts. You could saw cut one and snap the second side if you so desire. And the third one is back there at the knee wall. So when you think about it, three cuts out of that entire installation are all that require the use of a wet saw. So here's the age old question. I get this one almost every time that the test is run. Which one comes first? The floor for the installation? But think about this. If you do the floor first, will you be able to reach the wall? I have short arms. I'm only 5'9". I, I, I can't reach that wall. So I have to think of a method to do this. So in this case, how about the wall? If we do the wall first, does the border have to be installed on the floor first and stack off of it? Do we crib it up with some scrap tile and then put the floor tile in later? That's, that's a, a question that you would want to ask. So in this case, we have an installer working here, and he's got the entire floor, and he has a grid. You can see his, his lines for the grid are there, and they're mostly covered up now. But he's got those two triangles to set in. But look at this guy. Tell me what you see. Joseph? Everything is pre-cut. How do you know that? So all his, all his perimeter cuts and all his triangles are cut. So if he has his triangles cut, he's got the whole thing cut. So he did his grid pattern, went to the wet saw to cut three, piece, three pieces. He's already got them done. Yes, sir? The question that I have for you, when we're cutting them down, the medallions, the, well, not when we're cutting the medallions, when we're cutting the, the tiles that surround them. I try to cut those with my snap cutter. I use two different kind of snap cutters now. They're fragile. They're not cut. Not snap. How about a new wheel? Everything's possible. Okay. I've not had that issue, but again, you know your equipment better than I do. But normally, Ryan, they 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 cut pretty cleanly. And think about it with a wet saw. If you have a wet saw, Chris, you got the wet saw, you got your helper, they're really careful about putting the saw away in the blade, right? Hopefully. Oh, by the way, we have that four foot level. Whew. Pop that in there, hits the blade sideways, now the blade has this. That kick in the blade is gonna chip the tile, especially if you're cutting four and a quarter wall tile because the glaze is really brittle. So this is the age old question, which one do we install first? So there's his wall cuts stacked up there. He's already halfway up the wall. He's got his diagonal band already cut. Uh, anything, what else do you notice about his job there? Relative to an ANSI, an ANSI standard or a recommendation that's in the handbook as he's stacking the wall tile. Directional, Directional troweling, exactly right. He's got the floor border already installed and he stacked the floor first and then, or set, set the floor first and stacked the wall off of it. Does that have any ring of time management to it? So now we go back to this guy who has his grid laid out, cut his pieces, he has his dots marked. Uh, I find this to be a bit of a waste of time. Why do you have to put them in? If you, if you cut them to the grid that you've established on the floor and they fit the grid, is it really necessary to take the time to put them back on the floor to give it a double check? Maybe, as long as he uses his time wisely. Okay, that's fine. But those two pieces going in, notice that everything's dry. He hasn't said anything yet, so he's, he's taken the time to cut them, fit them, 
replace them as a dry lay on that surface. Now he's got to pick them all back up. Hopefully he's probably going to number them or stack them in some way that they come off the pile the same way that he put them there. Uh, it, it's hard to say, but it's, this is a whole, this is a process. How, how is this going to work and give us the best use of our time? That's the statement, got to think about it. So we know that the tile's got to be clean. We're going to apply the grout, so we use a float. And this is at the end of the day, this is where the uh, OS moment kicks in because we've got to get it grouted and we've got to get the sealant in before 4 o'clock. Um, again, use of time is really critical. So uh, everybody should know the, the finger test. So we're, if we're using a cementitious grout, which is what we use with this, if it transfers to your finger, is it ready? No. So we have to have enough time to allow the, the grout to uh, set up so that that moisture is eliminated so that we can do the cleanup or it makes our job much more difficult and we'll wash the grout joints out. So now the grout joints are low. We che we're te checking that as well. So during the cleanup, we have a couple of options that we can use. Uh, that guy probably needs a new float, but that's all right. Uh, and that's not the test, of course, but that's a small bathroom. So in this case, we have the opportunity to use a sponge. How many people here clean with a sponge? Sponges are great, right? Any other possibility? You, so you use a towel. Okay. Uh, so that, there you go. You read the slide, Eric. You got it. But I don't have the same kind you have. So we have that option the sponge, which all of us have used many times. Or we have, oh, that one. And by the way, don't take the one from the hotel. <laughs> Not a good plan. But the towel works really well. And here's a picture. This is, I'm sorry it's a little blurry, but these, these are two videos that I did. Thank you to Becky Serban of NTCA. Uh, what do you see between those two? Same tile, same grout. What do you see between the two? And this is the same cleanup process. Say again, Joseph. Less residue on the towel. The towel side is drier because you can wring the towel, towel out more effectively. The sponge still has a significant amount of water in it that's going to transfer it back to the tile. So in this case, there's a lot of residue being laid on the tile again. You also, with a sponge, because the sponge is very soft and it can dip into that joint. It picks up that grout, pulls it up onto the surface. Man, I just had that clean and now it's soiled again. So now you have to let that set up and come back and redo it again. The sponge really can cause some issues because with the bath towel, it's drier, but it's also flat. So it's not dipping down to that joint, picking that up and it also keeps your joints fuller, I should say more full than the, uh, yes sir, Chris. The towel damp. I'm sorry? Is the towel damp or dry? Yes sir. Tile, the towel is wrung out as best you can because you certainly don't want to introduce any additional water onto the surface because that just exacerbates the cleanup. Eric, yes, sir. I start with a dry towel, do it as much as I can with a dry towel, and without dripping it out, and then once it gets soiled, then I'll do a dry towel. I've never tried a dry, a dry towel. Maybe that's an exclusive for Maine. They're, they're, from, they're from the state of Maine, by the way. And that's, and that's the beauty of what we're doing here today, is the commonality, but it's also techniques. I had an old timer show me this thing about the towel, and I thought, this is brilliant. When I, when I go, went away from, we still used a lot of sponges, because especially when you have a cushion, and you've got to get that joint down, or if we're using uh, those favorites of the industry, the pebbles. Yeah, everybody's groaning when I say pebbles. Yeah, we've all been there. But you have to use a sponge that because you've got to contour. But as far as cleanup on a flat tile of this type, it just works so much more quickly, I can actually be done with that wipe right there. That's my first initial wipe right there. It's just, it's just so much faster, and it it's eliminates that back again, and back again, and back again. So now we've got the, the sealant. 
You can tape them. You can use the spray soap method. It doesn't matter to us how you accomplish that, but the sealant joints have to go in. Why do we need sealant joints? Expansion contraction. We have movement. The analogy I made a, a while ago, cold wall, warm wall, we've got movement. We've got dynamic and static working against each other. We've got to give it somewhere to go. So in this case, you can apply the soap and clean that off, and you should be a little more detail possibly, but that time is the magic hour. It's 4 o'clock, and we should hit that window. So we've got to that point. Have you finished? We hope so. Because one thing about the test, if you haven't taken or know anything about it, you must finish to be graded. If you don't finish, unfortunately, we are not able to grade it because there's not a finished product there to put to a final evaluation. A couple of things just to touch on. You may bring your own thin set. We've had the, we started off with conventional set because this used to be a two-day test. And that became apparent very quickly that it was too much time. So we cut it down to a one-day test. Well, when we cut it to a one-day test, it means we have to facilitate that with the use of rapid set. How many people use a rapid setting mortar? Not everybody. So if you're not accustomed, Chris, you use a lot of rapid? Yes, sir. So you're, you're accustomed to it. Yes. It acts in the bucket faster than it does on the floor, am I right? Much, much. So you've got to get it out of the bucket because it generates heat because they're calcium aluminate products and they generate heat, that heat sets it off more quickly, so you've got to get it out of the bucket. That's not always the easiest thing to accomplish. So in this case, when we have thin set, you can bring whatever you want. It's, it, it matters not to us. So it can be rapid set. See, well, I'm not, I don't like rapid set. I'd rather use conventional. Don't come to me at 3 o'clock and say, well, I can't ground it because it's still moving. That was your choice. It's a time decision. Melissa, was that a stretch or was that a question? Well, so actually, I just wanted to add to the thin set conversation because make sure you guys, if you're going to the test, and, here, let me stand if you guys are going to the test and you're bringing your own thin set, what you want to do, just make sure you pay attention to those manufacturer's instructions. Make sure you slake it for the amount of time because John Roberts is sitting right there <laughs> and then he's smoking a cigarette or whatever he's doing, but he's watching you. So if you're not slaking it for the proper amount of time, these guys know their thin set. Thank you. I couldn't have said it any better. Use of laser, you can do that. Oh, here comes Jim. Jim's the politic guy in the crowd. <laughs> you may use a laser if you so desire. When we started off, lasers were really not that popular. It's a tool that's available. So certainly you can utilize that. You may use screws. This is something a little different uh, than we've had in the past. But remember, at the end of the day, you do the tear out. So if you don't put a small piece of tape over the head, whether it's a square drive, a, a Phillips head, or whatever, you'll end up with a very difficult time getting those screws back out. So therefore, a pair of vice grips come in handy so that you can actually wind the screws back out. So it's, this is an old adage. You, you, you place it, you take it away. So if you're using screws, that's fine with us, but you have to bring your own screws and you have to make sure that they're actually removed as well. This is something that's relatively new. I went 13 years before I had an injury on a CTI test. 13 years, and this was a nasty one. A young man was cutting a piece of uh, backer board with a utility knife with an aluminum straight edge and the aluminum straight edge has a tendency to grab that blade and pull it up on top of the straight edge. You, now you have a little more drag. A little more drag means you pull a little harder. His thumb was about a third of the way down the straight edge. Yeah, Brenda, it's, it's, it was ugly. So I looked and I said, where is this person? And I said, anybody see him? He said, nope. Well, then I started to follow the trail. And we were on a mezzanine level, so I followed the trail down the stairs into the men's room. So I gave a, you guys okay in there? Yep. I said, I need to see that. So he's got it wadded up with paper towel, and I said, that has hospital written all over it. He said, I'm finishing this test. 
I said, that has hospital written all over it. He said, I'm finishing this test. So we wrapped it up, got him secured as best we could. Unfortunately, what did he lose? He, well, the time was not the issue with him. He was so far ahead, he was okay. He lost focus. focus. He didn't finish. And it wasn't because of time, because he just, you know, this is thumping, he's thinking, boy, that was really dumb, whatever it is. So cut gloves are a requirement. You must now bring cut gloves with you. Uh, answer your numbers range anywhere from one to nine. I think a four is about the ideal glove to, and when I first saw cut gloves, I thought this, really? I've heard about Kevlar, but I thought, okay. So I bought a bunch of them and took them back to the, the office at CTF. The, the one, eh, it's a little iffy. But once you get past three, it's amazing to me. They may leave a mark, like a metal mark on that glove. You will not cut them. It's amazing what they do. So anytime you're using a knife or a score cutter, you've got to wear cut gloves just to be protected. I think I had a pretty good record of one in 13 years, but that one was one, was one too many. So we just want to be safe in all the work that we do. Of course, you have to bring all your own tools. When we first started, we were supplying wet saws. That was the dumbest thing I think I ever did because nobody can cut on that saw but you. So when it's somebody else that says, what cuts to the left, it cuts to the right, it cuts crooked. No, you know how to hold the tray when you're working it so you can make that saw work. If it, even if it does cut crooked, you can make that saw work. But the next person coming up, Scott, you use that same saw that Brad has, I wish you well. <laughs> it, may not, it may not be the best tool to be used. This is the one that we put into place in uh, September of 2017, I never liked angle grinders. By the way, how many people here have an angle grinder that had an optional guard on it? Where did the optional guard reside? What's this? Well, when we had the test running and I had a young man that took the test at our place, and thank you to Mark Heinlein, he's the one that picked this up on Facebook, uh, Mark, do you remember that, that post where he was cutting backer board? Yeah. And what happened? How much? I think it was $2,500. $2,500 for cutting backer board. Where, where was he cutting, Mark? Uh, so he was inside or outside? Outside. So he got a fine for cutting outside with an angle grinder. He posted it on Facebook. So beware. I'm not saying they're not a great tool. But for the safety aspect, I was always nervous about angle grinders, but OSHA solved that puzzle for me. Cell phones, you may bring a cell phone and utilize that if you uh, have it in airplane mode and you can listen to music with earbuds. I actually had a guy came to a test, it was in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he brought this boom box. No, they, well, I shouldn't say boom box, that dates me. Uh, these were actually two Bluetooth speakers that he brought with a bass boost. <laughs> and the music he was playing was certainly not my genre, but I said, that's gotta go. He said, well, you didn't say I couldn't. So I said, oh, so that's when the policy went in because it's not fair. And a ringing cell phone. First thing I did when I met these gentlemen, I turned my phone off because it's not fair for me to be taking the test and your cell phone's going off every five minutes. If you've got that much work to do and you couldn't set it aside for the day, don't ruin my day with your cell phone. So it's really a, a matter of respect for everybody else that's taking the test so that we're sure that everybody has the same opportunity to complete the test. That word keeps popping up, focus. You lose your focus. I had a guy in, in Maryland just outside of Washington, D.C. This is no, no exaggeration. His phone had to have rung every five minutes. I said, Marcus, if that phone rings one more time, it's going to the truck. He said, but I have work to do. I said, then you make a decision. Either you're staying here and doing the test or you're going home and run the office. But I can't have your office dictating what everybody else has to endure with your phone ringing all the time and had this funky ring that just, everybody just lost, lost their focus. So if it rings, um, I have a counterpart that is with the IMI, and if you have a cell phone and it, it rings, you go. 
I'm not that strict or we aren't in the program that strict, but it will go to the vehicle at that point. So it's just fair to see that we do it in that fashion. So anybody have any questions? Jim. He wants you to, he wants you to. Oh, I'm sorry. So I, you may have already talked about this, and all I want to do is make sure everybody hears it again a second time. But what's the number one reason that installers fail the CTI test? The number one that stands above is layout. Layout, okay. And time management's got to oh, be right up there, right? They're, they're, they're this way. Yeah, one. right. Yeah. In other words, they're doing a good job, but they didn't finish, yeah. right? So um, I appreciate you putting this presentation on. That's great. Thank you. No, great question. Anybody else? I've got some who's who in the audience here. Yes, Mr. Heinlein, please. And, and Scott, I'm a little bit late too, but have you polled these guys? Have many of them taken the test? And did you, have any of them if you watched would, the if videos? If you would have showed up on time, I'm Marcus. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Let, okay, hold on, Mark. Here, this is for you, buddy. Yeah. We're gonna, we're gonna re-exercise what we did at 9.33. All those that have been involved in the CTI test, please raise your hand. Oh, what do you have? Olson? He's watched two. Come on. <laughs> okay, thank you. Further question? I was just, I, I know you mentioned the uh, time management video that Bart dubbed, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And I just want to reiterate, because I know Scott talked about it, watch the videos. Watch all of the videos. And, and Watch the videos. And what he's talking about, Jim, is the orientation video, of course. And we actually, you have that opportunity and you get that electronically when you sign up from Kathy. But we also have that available on the website that you can look at at any time. But we also do it at orientation. Well, I already saw this. Well, it's reinforcement. It just helps you to remember, Jim. Scott, so... Something's changed in the last year about those videos, though, right? They're now mandatory? We are going toward that. We haven't implemented it yet, but okay. yeah, we do have that. Uh, I'm going to poll the group. Of those of you that have been involved, would it be a stumbling block for you to be required to view the videos and take a three-question quiz and we're doing that because, Melissa, you can't turn it on and then go make dinner and come back. I know, it's tough. Three minutes, how, many, how many people would find that to be a difficulty? Stumbling block? I'm sure we're going to hear it, but we're going to do it because this, I said this to someone earlier, this is the most frustrating thing about this whole program is people that are coming and they're not ready. And usually, and John Roberts, if he were here, he would say, he walked in, and I, I chided John for two years to take the test. He said, you need to get this done. He said, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So he walked into my place. It was in December. Uh, we had a combination program with uh, a manufacturer and one of the uh, Facebook groups. So we had a combination program, and the CTI was thereafter. Uh, and John walked in and had seen the test for the first time. He said, I got this, man. I'm going to be done way before lunch. <laughs> right? Two seconds till four, John put his sponge down. And he passed. He says, you kicked my butt. I said, I had nothing to do with that. That was all you. So it's huge about time management to try to get yourself. And Jim's right that the, with the, with, we, we we're trying to elevate people. And, and if you don't pass the first time, it's not a failure. It's just a stepping stone than to move up to the next level and practice. But many times I've found that people, especially on the commercial side, don't do vapor retarding membrane. They don't do backer board. It's already done by another trade, so they don't know how to do it. It's part of the test. It's part of the standard. And that's what all the tests are run based on the standard. So the fact that it's not enforced in your area or you don't do that on your job site that's irrelevant. It's still part of the process. Hey, Scott, yeah. so you've heard me say this all the time. It's not pass or fail. 
you pass or you learn, right? You learn what to work on it and where you go with it. There is no failure in it. You are learning. It is a positive even if you don't pass. So that's the direction we're trying to go with this is this is a learning experience and we're training you to be a better installer. So um, I hate the word fail because you're not failing. You're learning and you're getting educated. So The ones that fail, Jim, to go beyond that are the ones that don't come. Yeah, they're, those they're, are the failed ones. They don't the even try. In the workshops that we do, I say this almost every workshop, thank you all for coming, but this is the group that I need. Mark, am I right? Absolutely. This is the group yep. we need because they're too busy. They're too smart. They've got it. I've been doing it for 30 years and never had a problem. <laughs> Any further questions? You guys have been great. Yeah, oh, yeah, I can't go with this. Um, just following our conversation last week down in Miami, I know that you mentioned that you have a test coming up soon. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to touch on that as well, because that's the one that I want to sign up. Bear with us. Okay. I will, I'll use the analogy of the NTCA. I do workshops for NTCA as well, which is where I saw you last week. We're putting 12 months of training in seven-month calendar. We still, to this point, have locations that won't let us in to run the test. So we're trying to find alternative locations to get that test set up. You call us, we will make it happen. That's, that's the number one thing there. Call. You talk to a friend, you talk to another installer, tell them to call, get signed up, because when you get signed up, we're going to put a schedule together and get there. We're going to make it happen. We just need to know who's going to be there. And we have an evaluator base that has grown uh, and we're, we're working to get them back up to speed because unfortunately we had the training and Mark was a, and a crucial part of that. We worked that process and we had a total of 50 people, including the ones we already have in place. We had 50. There's been some fallout because of job changes and things like that. But I have to got to get them up because we've got to brush the rust off. I'm being dead honest here. I did my first test several months ago after a year and a half. I created this test and I was rusty because I had to think, what's my next step? I'm being brutally honest here, but I had, to, I had to figure out what was the next step. By the time I did the second one, I was back in the groove and I was, I was okay. But we've got to get our evaluators back up to speed. So that's a great, that's a great point. Any other questions? We're just about out of time. I want to make sure I cover anybody's question. I'm sorry? I think my Mark, friend Mark Heinlein will say that I am the master of answering a question with a question. <laughs> it's a personal decision. With what I've given you, it's your choice. We don't grade you on whether you do the floor or the wall first. We're talking about end product. Now, we do take it apart to make sure we have coverage and fit and finish and those kinds of things. That's your choice. But when you look at this. Christopher, what is the right way? I don't know yet. That's why I ask. How do you do it? How do you do it? It depends. So I'm in a unique position where my entire career has been prepared. Over. So I'm following someone else's layout following what was already there and putting it back in the so I'm repairing a puzzle, basically. So I'm not determining the layout almost ever. Okay. Very so little of that. Let's do this. Years. How many would start with the floor? Raise your hand. And how many would start with the wall? So, is anybody right or wrong? Nope. There is no right or wrong. It's your, it's your, it's your decision. As long as Excellent point. Yes, sir. We have a, little, a minute or two, so please. When you, when you first asked that question and said it's personal uh, preference, some people like doing the walls first, some like doing the floors first. I'm on the other end of this program. You know, I've already been there, done that. I'm 70 years old. But I'm learning new things by this man asking me to come because I've been his mentor. Excellent. Thank you for being and here. And I still enjoy what I do for a living. 
and I've done remodeling all my life. It's and a great I trade. I've learned every year something new. Anytime a new product comes out, don't be afraid to go ask questions because of your age or you think you know it all because you don't. Somebody's going to come out with a better way than what you think it might be. And once you learn that, you'll be a better installer yourself. Thank you. You sent me an email saying exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly that. I just was going to leave. He'll, 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 he'll give you. <laughs> hey, but I have, I've got to tell you one thing. I met Ryan several years ago, right? When he, when he took the test the first time. When I showed up the second time. I looked at him and I said, you're half the man that you used to be. Yeah, half the man. Yeah. So congratulations, you did it. Anybody have any further questions? So, oh, thank you. So the paperwork that they give you, they set you up for, for success. Nobody here wants you to fail. The hosts of your test, Scott, this guy is the salt of the earth. If you guys have ever had a chance to have a conversation with this man, he is truly one of the nicest people I've ever met in my entire life. Thank you. So talk to him. Pick his brain. He will answer any question, not necessarily with a question, but sometimes <laughs> you'll get an answer and you'll get a really good one. So this test is very, very much... 80% mental. Get yourself in the game. Train how you fight. Go over the information. They will give you everything you need. Literally. Watch the videos. They will help you with your time management. They will get you there. Because nobody here wants you to fail. Remember that. Everybody wants you to succeed. Your peers want you to succeed. Scott, especially, out of everybody, will get, help you get there, but he wants to see you earn that number. So, so do you know why I answer a question with a question? Because how long have you been married? <laughs> 47 years. 47 years of marriage, Scott. We all know. I mean, that's the best way to keep yourself out of trouble. But I, I answer to the question with a question because I want you to figure it out. I, you sound like my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I come for free. Thank you, Scott. Anyway, thank you for inviting done. us and thank you for thank this. Thank you. Al, thank you for the time clock in the back of the room. Tim, Todd... Jeff, thank you guys. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming.